Hi, everyone. It's good to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking about applications of in-situ IV measurements. So in-situ IV is a relatively new capability that allows you to get IV curves and IV data on modules that are within your array, uh, like a, a module here highlighted in orange, without having to disconnect those modules from the array or without having to have standalone reference modules. How does it work? Well, you're going to take the module that you want to uh, have this continuous measurement on and wire it to the rest of the array going through the IV measurement equipment. And here I'm showing our new product, RD300i. During normal operation, your test module is going to be connected to the rest of the string through the IV measurement equipment and current will be flowing as shown in blue uh, normally. So the module is contributing to power production. But during a brief time slice every so often, we're gonna perform an IV sweep on that module. So that module is temporarily disconnected from the array as shown here in the orange and blue, the array is bypassed and we get an IV sweep. From that IV sweep, we can determine the typical IV parameters, ISC, Pmax, VOC, et cetera, anything you can get from an IV sweep. And that whole process takes a little less than half a second. We also have some faster modes uh, of doing it. And so the inverter never really notices that that module is gone. Uh, it looks the same as if there was just a passing cloud or a little bit of uh, shade, and uh, there's no disruption to the inverter when we do this. After the sweep, the module just returns to normal operation. I'd like to take a moment and thank uh, some of our test site partners, Sandia National Laboratories, Solve Energy, EDF Renewables, uh, they helped us a lot by providing test sites for this product over the last year and a half. And some of the data that I'm going to show came from those test sites. So thank you to them. Uh, and they're also, you know, th thanks to uh, those who, are, who have been installing this equipment lately. Okay, so here's an example of some data. We're looking at a period over about a week here. And uh, on the left side, we're looking at uh, IV sweep parameters like power, voltage, and current. And um, you can see you know, your typical patterns of sunny days and cloudy days. I'm going to zoom in on, uh, I've got three different periods highlighted in yellow, but I'm just going to look at two of them, April 25th and April 24th, and highlight some interesting things that you can see in this type of data. So first, if we look at the April 25th, take a look at the top panel you're seeing power parameters there. The red curve is showing you the Pmax value obtained from the module uh, by the IV sweep. And you can see that as uh, this cloud comes by, these seven, uh, these seven points, one through seven, um, show you on the IV curves here, labeled one through seven, uh, you can see that of course the irradiance is going down and the power is going down. So this example just lets you see that you can collect these continuous IV curves and you can associate them with specific points in time and, uh, and see events like this. Uh, here in the second example on uh, the April 24th day, uh, one interesting thing to note is that in red, the maximum power point of the module you can see here is above the actual power in blue that the module is putting out in between the IV sweeps. So how does that happen? Well, that's a sign that maybe you have curtailment or string mismatch or the inverters are not at maximum power point for whatever reason. So that's the type of thing that you can see from this data is uh, what the module could do and then how it's actually operating. Okay, those are just some examples. Let me go into different types of applications that you can do with this, uh, with this type of data. So one of them I wanna talk about is bifacial irradiance. And as we've already talked about in other talks today, uh, with uh, bifacial systems, you want to measure the total irradiance reaching your modules, total from front and rear. And this is very difficult to do as some speakers have outlined. One of the reasons that it is difficult is because the irradiance on the rear side 
is very non-uniform as shown in these simulations, which uh, uh, come from this uh, paper that um, we were fortunate enough to co-author uh, with, with the group shown there. So the rear irradiance, you can see the scale here on the right, is varying uh, by quite a bit as you go from end to end of the row and across the row. So if you're going to put irradiance sensors somewhere on the rear side, you have to choose very carefully, as uh, for example, as Nicholas pointed out uh, earlier. So that's just one reason. Um, now, there are a lot of different things you could try to do. Um, for example, the outboard sensor approach that Jeff uh, talked about in the, in the last uh, session. You can also do a radiance transposition from, uh, let's say, MET station data. You can put uh, sensors uh, at point locations on the rear side, as Nicholas talked about. But one of the things you can do is to use a reference module. Uh, so you can take IV sweeps on your module and use that as a way to measure irradiance. And how would you do it? Well, typically, you're going to take the ISC that you measure on that module, and you're going to temperature correct it and then scale that up to get an effective irradiance. So hold that thought in mind, because I'm going to ask you a question about it in a moment. There have been a number of good papers in recent years that have looked at using uh, reference modules uh, for bifacial irradiance. I've got uh, some of them listed here. And generally what people find when they compare different methods for bifacial irradiance is they don't agree, <laughs> okay? Which is not too surprising. Uh, but in both uh, reference one and reference two here, what was seen is that comparing uh, point pyranometer locations to a reference module found that the, uh, the reference module normally didn't produce as much as would be expected from the uh, measurements at those point locations. So uh, that's just a little uh, example of some of the things that are seen when you compare measurements on a real module with other kinds of measurements. And I will refer you to the papers to look at more detail on that. Here I have a uh, question, food for thought for all of you. Um, so we've been talking a lot about how to account for the average of this non-uniform irradiance on the rear side. And I'd like to ask a question for you to think about, does the module power actually follow the average irradiance across the module plane? Is that really the number that, that we want, the average in the, in the case that the irradiance is non-uniform? And a second question is, does the ISC of the module anyway actually correlate with average irradiance? So I invite you to think about these questions and maybe come and find me afterwards and we'll talk about it. Uh, and I'll share my answers uh, with you. And just as a hint, I think the answers are no uh, to both of these questions, but it'd be fun to talk about. Let me move on to uh, another application. And I'd like to thank uh, Will Hobbs from Southern Company for uh, suggesting this application, Will's in, in the room uh, right now. So this one is real-time plant prediction. Okay, well, um, why are we interested in that? We're seeing more and more headlines uh, like this one uh, shown here. As there's more and more PV added to the grid, it will start to be the case that that PV is not always running at 100%. Um, you may intentionally want to run your plant in a curtailed state in order to have some reserve capacity so that you can respond to grid regulation signals and put out a little bit more energy when called for. And that's uh, within the overall topic of uh, uh, ancillary services. And there are some other headlines that I captured here that are, that are more recent. Okay, but if, if you're going to do that, if you're going to keep some reserve power, you need to know how much reserve do I have? Uh, and so why is that difficult to, uh, to figure out? Whoops, okay, this is uh, supposed to be a video here. It's uh, not quite playing, but imagine uh, a solar plant from above and imagine that you have clouds that are rolling by here. Well, some of your inverters are going to be in a um, clear, location unshaded and they'll be putting out lots of energy, but uh, some of them will be shaded and putting out less. So at any given time, it's difficult to know uh, exactly how much power you could put out if called upon to run the plant at 100%. One approach 
uh, that is uh, used for this is to designate some inverter blocks to be reference inverters. And these will uh, always run at 100%, never be curtailed. And then you can make some simple assumptions like, oh, well, every other inverter will do the same as the average of the four reference inverters. Uh, but something that we're exploring in a paper that you can come see at PVSE is the possibility of using more measurement points, like shown in red, reference modules distributed throughout the site. And if you have more measurement points, then maybe you can get a better prediction. So um, here's an example of how that um, might work. Um, here you can see predicted and measured power over the course of one particular day, and there's an inset there. Uh, the measured power is in red. And then a prediction using four uh, reference inverters is shown in the dotted line. And a prediction using 28 reference combiners, we didn't have modules, reference modules for this study, but we had reference combiners, is in the dashed uh, red line. And what you can see is when adding additional measurement points here, you get a better prediction because you have more points distributed throughout the site. Uh, so just how this tends to work out is that when you have a small number of reference inverters, which allows you to achieve a high curtailment, a high reserve capacity, uh, you get a lower error in predicting what your instantaneous power output could be if you uh, have measurements at more, uh, at more points. Well, we have a lot to say about that real-time prediction application. You can come see our uh, paper at PVSC or, or talk to uh, either of us at the break. Okay, another application that I'd like to uh, highlight here is soiling uh, measurements. This is something you can do with in situ IV. Now take a look at these modules and you see that there's uh, soil collected at the bottom edges. And of course that's very common. Uh, soiling tends to deposit uniformly across modules, but then because of the action of precipitation and gravity, the soiling typically will fall down to the lower edge. And so here I want to ask you a, a quiz question. Uh, imagine that you have a module like this, it's a half cut module, and the bottom strip of it is covered in soiling in such a way that it, the soiling covers 1.3% of the active area of that module, just like shown there. And so let me just ask for a show of hands, um, who thinks that the power loss in this situation is answer A, zero, zero percent? Okay, no, no hands. Uh, how about 1.3%, any, any hands there? Okay, we have very few players in this game, maybe. And uh, answer C, 10%, any, any answers? That, wow, okay, very good. Um, so yeah, it, it turns out that it is answer, answer C. When you put all of your soiling at the bottom edge there, you're going to get a big impact in power. Now we can consider this a couple of ways. Imagine uh, the same half cut module. Uh, and by the way, thanks to everyone for playing. Um, imagine the same half cut module when it's clean and it has this IV curve in blue. Now take that same module as shown on the last slide, it's in portrait and it's soiled at the bottom. It's, you're going to get this IV curve in gray or put it in, uh, in landscape mode and have it soiled uh, in this way, okay? Well, these two orientations, I chose them because they both give you 10% power loss, okay? But the IV curves are very different. And what you'll see is that for the orange curve, the short circuit current didn't go down at all, even though we lost 10% in power. Uh, for the gray curve, the portrait, uh, the short circuit current went down by a greater factor than the power went down by 14%. So if you want to know what's going on with power, then you should measure power <laughs> rather than short circuit current. Uh, and that's why using IV curves for soiling measurement can be very beneficial. It also has a bearing on the question I asked earlier about bifacial irradiance. And so it would be uh, very interesting to talk about that at one of the breaks. Okay, so how, how do we use this for soiling measurement? Well, one way to do it is to have a clean module uh, that you know, is cleaned by your O&M staff. And we're gonna compare this uh, clean module power to a dirty module power. And so you could have a system uh, like this where you have uh, two 
uh, in-situ IV measurement units, one on a clean module, one on a soil module, and they're connected together so that they can make an automatic comparison between the dirty module and the clean module, and thus you get a soiling ratio. Uh, as kind of an advanced uh, option, we can also add some reference cells on the rear side in this kind of typical position that's been talked about today and potentially eliminate the clean module. And so that would be interesting to talk about. Okay, we'll also have a paper uh, on this at PVSC. So if you're there, please come in and talk with us some more about it. One other application, uh, potential application I wanted to talk about is uh, degradation measurements. So if you can measure power in situ over time, then you can look at degradation. And uh, there's a couple of ways to think about that. One is you just look at the trend in power over time. But another way is you can look at parameters extracted from the shape of the IV curve. So as an example, um, let's look at, uh, if anyone went to PVRW this year, you might remember the phrase, big floppy modules. Uh, that was very, uh, very much bantied about. As modules get uh, bigger, maybe cracking will become an issue. And when you have cracking, series resistance will go up. And you can see series resistance increases in the shape of the IV curve. So even without measuring losses in power, which is challenging because you have to normalize it for irradiance, you could see changes in parameters of the module from the IV curves themselves. Uh, similarly, PID, um, which uh, causes shunting defects in modules could lead to uh, changes in the shape of the IV curve where you might see uh, a decrease in the shunt resistance of the module, which shows up as a greater slope at the um, low V part of the curve, for example. So those are just some possibilities. Uh, this is a generic uh, plot that shows many different types of module degradation and how they contribute to power loss over, over time. So of course, if you can measure your in-situ power loss, then you can uh, hope to track degradation. Okay, uh, so it's very common in, uh, in sites, right, to test the modules at some uh, basis, maybe with uh, a, a mobile flash tester like this one, and I love the uh, advertisement they have on the back there. Have you tested your modules yet? Um, so, you know, if you're doing this, you may also want to complement that by in situ IV testing, where instead of having to pull the modules off to test them, you can get continuous data on them. So that is a possibility. Okay, finally, what kind of capabilities do you need to do these different applications? So at a high level, just outline them. One thing you need is to be fast um, because uh, for example, for irradiance measurement applications, you want to do that very frequently. Uh, and so uh, in our system, for example, we can update up to every uh, two seconds. Also for modern modules, you need a very wide input range, high currents, high voltages, high powers. And then finally, we think that being able to network these systems is important so that you can do applications like soiling where you want to compare a clean and, uh, and a soiled module in general. So just to summarize, I wanna just leave you here with the different applications that I highlighted, the irradiance measurement, uh, real-time prediction, soiling, degradation, and of course, I'm sure there are other applications and I'd you know, love to have discussions with anyone about your ideas on that. So thanks very much.